Okay, I believe we can start the, the lecture. So it is my pleasure to welcome my colleague and friend uh, Fabio Parmegiani from the same University of Nine. Okay, since we are approaching Christmas, I will, as an introduction, I will quote a passage of the Bible, Matthew's Gospel. Jesus was preaching as usual. And there is a strange sentence. Uh, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Well, it seems that uh, from ancient times, salt retains something unique. Um, seems to be a trivial material, not a vine material, but uh, yes, a trivial material. We can buy, it's cheap, we can find it everywhere, basically. And, uh, but apparently it has unique properties that were known from the from ancient times and is will documented also during the lecture, okay? And it's, it's so interesting how from a apparently trivial material you can uh, um, you can talk about chemistry, talk the gen about the general properties of matter, and I hope have a have a, um, a fun. Thank you, and Fabio, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we'll have the lights up in a second. It's a great pleasure to be here again. I've been uh, a guest of. Professor Tessaro's course for a number of years now, and we've always done a Christmas lecture on a bit on a practical side of chemistry, showing some experiments, showing something related, especially related to the history of the periodic table. This year we decided to change the cards on the table a little bit, and we will move to a different topic, which seems only partially related to chemistry. Of course, the topic, as you can imagine from the title, is, is salt, but it actually contains a lot of chemistry, but not only chemistry. So this will not be a chemistry lecture. It will be a lecture which involves a little bit of chemistry, and that will be towards the end. So I want to uh, take you to a journey, a journey through uh, art, through history, to, through culture, using as a guiding um, theme or object, the chemist or the, the science and the technology behind uh, crystal of salt. Okay, so chemistry with a grain of salt, which of course means with some reasoning, with some thought as well, but also emphasizing the fact that there is a lot of chemistry behind this apparently very common and um, well-known material. So salt is an, a very ancient mineral that's been available to mankind since thousands of years. Literally, there is evidence of the use of salt to season food since at least 6000 BC. So 6000 years before the birth of Christ. And certainly there would be evidence even further back in time. But of course, we cannot easily uh, be sure about that. It is present in seawater. So it's about three, four percent of the composition of seawater, depending on the Location, of course, it changes a little bit, but more or less that's the amount. And that makes it the most abundant ionic compound on Earth, without any shadow of a doubt. It's extremely common, but its story, its um, implications in art, history and culture are really fascinating. And I hope I will be able to show you a little bit today and also maybe to awake a little bit of curiosity into, into you. So not learning something literally now today, but maybe the idea of rushing home and looking up some of the things you've seen today. So we'll start with a bit of history, the history of, of salt. And in particular, we'll start with the Latin name, which is the word sal. Of course, for Italian speakers here, that's quite easy, but also for English speakers, but not in all languages, it's the same. And this uh, word, of course, it's derived from Latin. It's very similar in many, in many languages. And you might have already noticed, and if you haven't noticed, if you never noticed, you can uh, be, be aware of that right now, many uh, words, the etymology of many words related to food, like salad, sauce, sausage, salami, and salsa, all derive from this mineral, even though some of these items don't even contain salt. It's because it's what people use to make food more savory. As David quoted before, what will we use to make salt more savory if it will lose its taste uh, from the Bible? So it's been used for seasoning for many, many years, for thousands of years, but also it's been used for preservation. So using salt to prevent decay, to prevent corruption of food, but not only, also from corpses and so on. So it's quite common to associate the word and the item um, salt with permanence, with uh, durability in time, and also with something that tastes much better. 
Also, another word which is even less commonly associated with salt, but etymologically strongly related, is salarium. The salary is mm, what we get paid when you perform a certain duty. When you have a, a job, you get paid your salary. And salary comes from salt because originally, this might be slightly inaccurate in some periods of the uh, Roman Empire, at least, or maybe not all the time. Soldiers were paid in salt. So your salary was literally a bag of salt. So you would receive something like this. That shows you that it was extremely precious. They would prefer to pay you with salt, not because it was less valuable, because it was more valuable than certain minerals and gold and so on. And still today, at least in Italian, we, in Turkish, we do that. Salty means expensive. Something very salty means that it has a high price. Not in all languages, not in English, for example. But that is quite an important point. And also, this is a uh, medical focused uh, university. So even the word salus, some people claim, comes from the etymology of salt. And that dates back to the Roman Empire, or even um, the, one of the very earliest books, or maybe the, let's say the longest and largest book ever survived from the Latin period, which is this book here, which I'm sure you've heard at least once, The Naturalis Historia, The Natural History by Pliny the Elder. This was published in 77, um, well, around 77 um, uh, AD, and it was the first encyclopedia, or at least the first uh, encyclopedia that survived until us. It has a very modest title. It wants to explain and illustrate the whole history of everything alive or the whole world and whatever. And it shows you a lot of the, the ways uh, Roman people used to think and the way they used to face uh, things like uh, the, the mining of minerals or the even curing diseases. And that's what I wanted to show you regarding this uh, this book. There is a very long passage here that we, of course, we will not read in detail, but you can see I pointed out some. This comes from uh, chapter 31st, which is about minerals, in particular about salt. And you can see, uh, and if you want to look into the text, you will see the translation. But of course, you can see many diseases, many um, ailments like uh, itching or uh, um, pains in the gums or suffusion in the eyes or even the uh, snake bite or um, there's even one, the crocodile bite, there it is down here. So all of these maladies, all of these um, ailments were designed, were cured with remedies containing salt. And you can see in this text, I mean, if you want to look it up, you can find it out for yourself, recipes on how to prepare a remedy that contains salt for the specific conditions. Of course, I'm not entirely sure that the crocodile bite would be cured with salt, but that's how precious it was to them, not only because of the permanence, not only because of the ability to season and make your food more savory, but even as a remedy. Um, so at the end of this section, Pliny concludes uh, with this sentence, ergo vita humani or sine sale non quit degere. There's no way to live a more humane life without salt. Humane needs to be intended as, as civilized. Yeah? It's something that really sets men apart from other creatures because we are able to exploit the, the amazingness of this material. That might be too much probably, but clearly it was a very important material for uh, already at Roman um, times. And this made it extremely precious. So over time in history, we had a huge number of uh, wars, uh, wages, economical problems due to the ability to control the supply of salt. Just a few examples from history. This is 1930, the Satyagraha, the, march, the salt march, one of the many very successful non-violent protests by, led by Gandhi. And that was against a tax on salt to prevent the most poor people and most poor classes to be too affected by the, the very heavy salt taxes imposed by the British government. Or also in changing completely part of the world, 1877, the El Paso Salt War, just to control the availability of, of salt, there is a stone that commemorates the place where this took place, um, to control the um, availability in the um, possibility to extract salt from very precious lakes at the border between Texas and Mexico. And also lastly, for, for what concerns the history of, of salt, one more um, uh, anecdote, let's say, that regards very much our country, uh, Italy. And that's uh, quoted here from the, from the Commedia, from, from Dante. Of course, it's in Italian, but we'll get there in a second. In around uh, 1100s, 1100, something like, um, yeah, 11th, 12th century, Pisa and Florence were at war. So they were fighting with all means possible. And one of them, since Pisa was in control of the sea, was to prevent the availability, prevent the, the, the supply of, of salt to 
uh, to the, the um, inhabitants of Florence. And fl still today, in Florence, in particular in certain areas of Tuscany, but especially in Florence, you still find bread without salt or with very, very little salt. It is still quite common today because that was their reaction. Instead of paying higher and higher taxes to Pisa, they decided to uh, start getting accustomed to lower and lower amounts of salt in their food and especially in bread. So we still find the so-called pane sciocco, which is bread with very little salt, especially in the area of Florence. This is a quote from the Commedia where Dante imagines, of course, it's easy for him to write this because he wrote it after everything happened, but um, he writes, tu proverai si come sa di sale lo pane altrui. You will know how salty it is to eat someone else's bread because he will be forced to leave Florence. He will be exiled because of his political uh, position and he will never see Florence again. He will die as an, uh, as a, uh, in, in exile. And he says, you will see, how, this is an ancestor of Dante prophesizing to him that he will be exiled. And he says, you will see how salty it is other people's bread. So that's another beautiful example that shows a local, maybe a little bit of a local niche of history of Italy, but it's quoted already in the comedy. Of course, it's easy for him to write that because when he wrote it, he was already exiled. So it's quite easy to make predictions like that. But obviously it gives you an insight of the local uh, history. Also mythology, religion, uh, there is quite a lot of connections that we could mention, especially because of those double meanings that we mentioned before. So permanence, uh, inviolability, the possibility to draw a line between one world and another, something like that has been associated very much in magic and superstition with salt. Durability, also purity, salt is crystalline, it's a beautiful thing to look at, it looks like pure. So all of these values have seeped into religion and uh, superstition. This is just one example. This is an Aztec uh, goddess of bodies of water, in particular salty water bodies. Uh, it's supposed to be the daughter or the sister of the god of rain, something like that. And it was uh, associated with a very long festival, a two week long festival, uh, during which one of the female war captives were dressed up like this goddess, where you see the, the uh, dress with waves that uh, are um, white and, and blue to represent salt and water, and it was killed, sacrificed at the end of the festival. Of course, it's, it's a long, long lost history, but that's to show even to have a divinity, a goddess dedicated to salt clearly shows you the importance for that. Also, still in Eastern European countries, this is the tradition of salt and bread. When you have your guest, your most respected guest at home, you would offer them two things, salt and bread. So something to eat and something to season it with. That is still in use in many Europe, Eastern European countries, and that's a representation of how precious, how valuable that is. You give someone that you care about food and something to season the food with. Um, David quoted the Bible at the beginning. There are at least 13 references to salt in the Bible. I've just selected two of them here. You can see how salt is associated with offerings. Yeah? The priests will cast salt upon them or um, here, every um, meat offering you season with salt. That's because it's a way of showing that you are sacrificing not only the object of your, uh, of your choice, but even you put on, on that something precious, something to seal the uh, permanence of this deal with, with God or with the uh, divinity you are making the offering to. Even in magic, in superstition, sometimes you see magic circles drawn in salt because that's the border. No one can pass that border. It's something permanent. That is very common. And um, another thing that you all have seen, spilling salt. If you spill some salt, clearly that is a sign of bad luck. It's supposed to be an influence of the devil. It's something that's quite bad that it's, it's going to happen to you. Yeah, um, in some countries, even it's including Italy, it's quite common to pick up the salt and throw it behind your shoulder. That's supposed to, uh, to blind the devil that's lurking behind you. I don't know how realistic that is. I promise this is going to be a science lecture, but there's also a little bit of history we cannot uh, neglect. And if you think this was all lost in the past, um, clearly not. I mean, there are still many um, science or pseudosciences that are based on the idea of crystals, not only of salt, but here you can see the beautiful uh, pink salt lamp. I find them particularly beautiful, but and I have a few doubts on the healing effects that they are claimed to have. Certainly they are beautiful objects to look at and they are still quite common in any fair, in any market, you can see them on for sale. So uh, this is just one very, very small portion of the long and extremely complex history of salt. 
we'll try to skip over different topics and we'll move also to art because as many uh, beautiful things, as many mineral and objects that people have found in nature, also salt has inspired creativity, has inspired artists, has in inspired even poets. I don't have any poetry on that except for a little bit of uh, text later on. I just chose three examples to show you that salt was really important even in artistic um, representations and artistic movements. The first one is probably a painting or a fresco, I should say, that you all know because everyone knows this painting. And I'm very surprised that not everyone will know the next painting that I will show you. But this is, of course, the Last Supper in the um, refectory of the convent of Santa Maria delle Grazie here in Milano. If you haven't seen it before, take a, maybe half a day to uh, spend a little bit of time there and have a look at it because it's quite nice. Um, why am I showing you this? This is the Last Supper, so it is a very famous scene. It's described in the Bible. It's when the uh, these disciples are gathering with Jesus for the very Last Supper before his execution. But one very important thing here is the way Leonardo described this scene. It's not a typical, you know, solemn idea. You, they don't look like the, the round table and the, and the knights around it. It's a very mm, emotional moment. It's exactly when Jesus says, one of you will betray me. And you see all the figures moving away, moving around. And especially you see one here, which is pushing forward, that's Peter, that's pushing forward uh, to, to say, is it, is it me? Is it me that I will betray you? Uh, they are all, of course, in, in anger, in fear, in, in disgust. And uh, Peter is moving forward, pushes this uh, figure here towards the table. And you see something tiny here next to the, um, to the sleeve of the, the blue sleeve of this character. That little figure that you see there, I tried to zoom it up on uh, here, but it's a very blurry picture. And also it's very difficult to see it in the real painting. So if you go there from now on, have a look. There's this blob of gray stuff here. That's a salt cellar. So that is Judas and is being pushed forward by the movement of St. Peter, pushes forward this salt cellar, which spills on the table. That is clearly a sign of bad luck because he will hang himself a few moments later. Judas, of course, was the one who betrayed Jesus really. I said not all of you have heard of the painting that I'm going to show you next because luckily, so this was done with a very experimental technique. So the fresco is not very firmly attached to the wall. So it required multiple restorations and it's very difficult to get an idea of what it really was. But fortunately, Leonardo was a genius. Of course, he had many pupils, many students around him and at least three perfectly identical copies still exist today. And one of them is this. That is exactly the same scene painted with exactly the same color, but not on a fresco, not on a wall. So you can still find this is called the, the Certosa copy by Gian Pietrino, which was a student of Leonardo, and it contains exactly the same arrangement of characters, same colors. And you see here much better, clearly the sole cellar being spilled by Judas. Yeah? So that is a copy which is present in a museum in the UK, uh, in the Royal Academy of Arts in London. And that is an ideal, an identical copy. So you can have a look at that and you see really what Leonardo was trying to, to get. It was like that on the wall, of course, but then over time it was degraded quite heavily. So again, here in one of the most in unexpected places, you still see a little reference by Leonardo to the uh, importance of salt in history. Then another curiosity, I normally call these, these lectures the rabbit hole lectures because you, you are given a topic and you start looking through the internet, looking through fun facts and you find things that you haven't you probably never imagined to uh, to include. And I found this Dutch painter, which I've never heard before. Probably you also have never heard of it before. Um, his name, I'm trying my best to pronounce it, Peter Kleisch, Kleisch, something like that. I don't know exactly. He was apparently obsessed with salt. So he was an exponent of the golden age of painting in the, um, he lived next to Antwerp. He worked in Belgium and in the Netherlands for a long time. And he painted over and over similar scenes. He called them the uh, little meals or little breakfast. I don't know who would have breakfast with oysters, but still uh, that was the idea. And he always, almost always in hundreds, of, well, several dozens of paintings, put salt in a pre predominant position. You see a very um, a salt cellar that overtakes the whole picture and you see the little bit of salt very important in the in the meal itself. I just show you a few of them. There's some with with crab and you see even even more uh, decorated and uh, opulent uh, salt uh, holders. 
or here we have a few more. You see salt here, salt there. This one has the same cell, or sometimes even painted the same objects. I don't know exactly if there was a meaning behind it, and if anyone happens to know more, please let me know because I'm very curious. I couldn't find any information. Clearly, he was a bit obsessed with salt, and that is uh, um, also giving the, the most, even the, the cutler is not as uh, opulent as the salt shaker. So probably this is meant to implicate something that we don't exactly know. And that's the last one. Uh, he called them li light meals. I don't, I probably would not call this one a light meal. There's a whole turkey in there, but still you see there are many um, quite rich items, quite rich decorations, but still salt doesn't, uh, is not missing. There's here a paper cone with pepper and a little bit of salt next to it. So he clearly valued it very much. Step forward to modern history, to modern uh, art. There is um, an artist in Japan, Yamamoto Motoi, who is probably also not particularly well known, but he has a, an extremely strong artistic connection with salt. So this is a uh, quote taken directly from his website, from his web page. When I look at salt, I think of the ancient times when this salt used to support someone else's life. And he uses salt as a, a temporary, as an ephemeral material to build his sculpture, his works of art. And I collected here a few uh, pictures, so the, the collecting the memory of the past lives, the memories of the, all the living creatures that enjoyed that salt in the previous um, centuries. And I've selected just a few pictures because they are really, really beautiful. And keep in mind, these are not permanent things. So he normally does that on the, I don't know, this is the floor of, a, of an exhibition space. You can imagine him with a little dropping pipette, dis dispersing little wires of salt. There is no stencil here, there is all done by hand for a surface that covers maybe a, whole, a room twice this size. Or even here, you can see a, an endless stair made with blocks of salt and salt on the floor as well. And this which is one of my favorite, the labyrinth, which had to start, of course, producing from one side because you cannot step on it after you've started. So that's uh, quite an impressive one and, uh, on the floor of a cathedral. This was, I think, in uh, Southern America, but I might be wrong. It's called the labyrinth. And then the last one, which is, I think, the most impressive, the Sakura Shibefuru, which is 100,000 rose petals drawn one by one with a stencil and salt. And you see that the density is very high in the middle and very low at the end, at the edges. So it's a bit like a 1s orbital that you, of course, all know. And this was done from the middle. So imagine how much patience and how much precision it requires to do something like that. Absolutely amazing. He's still alive. If you are very lucky, you might be able to see one of his exhibitions, which are all over the world whenever uh, the, there are opportunities to have a dedicated space because, of course, you cannot get people to walk through them. Uh, but also the other nice point is when the exhibition is over, he always asks the visitors to collect some of the salt and bring it back to the sea wherever they go in the world. So all the salt gets returned to the sea in the, uh, in the natural process of this memory of life that the salt is supposed to represent. OK, so this is about uh, a little bit of history, a bit of art, culture and so on. But also we need to talk about science. We need to introduce some aspects of science that are really relevant for the history of salt. And salt became extremely important for people didn't know what salt was made of. Yeah? Alchemists believed in the four elements, air, earth, fire and water. We normally talk about that in the Christmas lectures, but this year we take a bit of a different approach. So salt was. Uh, became very important when this guy came about. This is Theophrastus Aureolus Philippus Bombastus von Hohenheim. With a name like that, you want a pseudonym because nobody would ever call you. So he called himself Paracelsus, much better than Celsus, which was the most important, most famous physician in ancient Rome. You know certainly about Paracelsus because of all your uh, studies before now, and I'm glad that you know already who he is, but he was also a quite a, I would say, a great chemist. At the time, the chemical knowledge was a bit um, behind, of course, there was still almost alchemy level of chemistry, but Paracelsus brought forward a very important idea. First of all, he was the first iatro chemist. So iatro is the same origin as the word, I don't know, pediatrician, obstetrician, it means a doctor, a physician of some kind, but it's a iatro chemist. So he was a chemist applying chemistry to medicine. That was the very first contrib very important contribution that he made. He thought that chemicals and chemical materials could be used in curing specific diseases. And he also was known for uh, a theory of the composition of matter. So he came up with, uh, so he completely, he was a very um, 
aggressive character. He had public displays of uh, uh, despise for other people's theories. He burnt books in the middle of the square, so he was a very aggressive character. But he came up with his own idea because he thought all the previous um, stories, all the previous fun, fun foundations, let's say, of, of science and the composition of matter, primordial chemistry, were considered completely ir untrustable and irrelevant. So he came up with his own idea and he thought that all matter, all bodies are made of these three things, sulfur, mercury and salt. So that is when salt really became considered even an element. Nobody were, was able to split salt into simpler things. So for him, sulfur, mercury and salt were the three fundamental constituents of all types of matter. In particular, referring that to the human body, he referred salt, of course, to the solid part of the um, physical part of the body, sulfur to the soul and mercury to the spirit. So the different types of feelings, the reasoning and so on. And he introduced this idea of using chemical components, chemical materials to influence, to interact with these components of the human body. And from there it came all the studies of iatrochemistry and even toxicology. He was the first one to study the poisonous effects of substances in a systematic way with publications and so on. That, of course, didn't last very long. Uh, chemistry moved forward quite quickly, but this was for a long time a le the leading theory against the four elements of the alchemists. And by the way, if you talk about the modern elements, well, sulfur and mercury are elements, so he wasn't that far off after all. Salt, of course, is made of two elements, and we will discuss that later on. So salt is amazing. We have a lot of uh, references to, to history, to art, and we know very well how it looks like. I don't even need to show you a sample. You all know how salt looks like. But just because now we have an endless supply of salt, it's no longer a precious material. So how do we get salt? Where does it come from? And again, it comes from the same sources that ancient people used. There is no difference. It's just that it's more industrialized, so it's easier to get today. We'll go back to the very first book of uh, mining processes. This is the Dere Metallica by Georg Bauer. That was a very, eclect um, a very curious man. He was very interested in everything around him. And he uh, wrote this compilation of beautiful descriptions of processes that were considered extremely prized secrets up to that point. People didn't want to give away trade secrets on how to mine minerals, how to make, I don't know, pigments or colors or chemicals and so on. And also because you never know, you get accused of witchcraft and you get burned at the stake, so it's better to keep your secrets quite well uh, protected. So he, for the first time, compiles this beautiful book. It's called De Re Metallica, Everything That Is Metal, about metal things. Yeah, And he compiles this... Um, of course, salt is not a metal, but he is concerned about minerary processes in general. So how to take metals out of the earth, smelting, um, working the metals as well. And the very important thing that distinguishes this book from all the other similar ones that were published later is the amount of graphical material. It contains incisions. It contains beautiful engravings that show exactly how these processes were made. This is in the range of uh, 1560, something like that. So you see these processes, which are exactly how at the time salt was procured from natural sources, either from seawater. You see here the sea indicated with A, with some trenches where you can lead the seawater into separate basins, separate boxes dug into the ground next, uh, next to the sea. And the sunlight evaporates from some of these surfaces, the water, and you can get when the trench gets completely empty, you can rake up the salt and fill another one. And that's how most of the salt was manufactured from seawater at the time. Of course, all manual labor, it took a long time, also needs to be transported to everywhere else, and therefore it takes a lot of money, and that's why it was a precious material. But also in some areas where um, seawater was not that common, or maybe some areas like the UK, for example, where the water was abundant. I mean, there's a lot of seawater, but not a lot of sunlight. There is a much better way. You can start extracting, sea, uh, extracting salt from this. This is not a water bottle. It is a water bottle, but it's full of something that is not water. This is full of brine. Brine is a very concentrated form of salt water. Brine is actually a saturated solution of salt in water that in some places comes out of the ground. If you dig in uh, deep into the in, in salty deposits in the, in the um, caves or in, down in the earth, you might find some water bodies which are completely saturated with salt, especially associated with um, areas containing a lot of rock salt, so solid salt. In the, so in damp countries where there is not much salt, they would normally pump up or collect this brine 
and dry it up over a fire in these pans. These are just rectangular, very wide pans. They are made of lead. They are made entirely of lead. They are blocks of lead soldered together. And you light a fire underneath, underneath so that all the water evaporates and you can rake up the salt again. So these were the two main methods to make salt all over the world. And then Agricola goes on describing the usefulness of this material and all the processes you can uh, perform with it. What most people would think about when you speak about metallurgy and uh, mining processes is this book, because it's extremely famous. It's the most famous book on metallurgy in history. But what most people don't know is that there was an almost identical book published 10 years before by an Italian. It's called the De la Pyrotechnia, which doesn't have to do with fireworks. Pyrotechnia means the technique of fire. So anything related to smelting, to burning material. There's also some description of pyrotechnic devices, yes. But most importantly, it's about processes involving fire. So pyrotechnics, so the technique of fire. And in here you have, this is an Italian, uh, you have almost the same description, and in particular, I want to point out one section, del sal comuno, so the, about common salt, the usual common salt from cave and from water, so rock salt and sea salt, as um, you can probably read if you want to look at all these old books are available on Google Books, so if anyone is interested, you can find them for free. It takes a bit of time to read them and to um, dive through them, but it's quite a lot of history that you can learn. And especially there is one section which is about the salt that the Florentines used because of course they were cut off from Pisa uh, for, for what concerns the, the supply of salt from the sea. So they found their own way and they said in Tuscany, in the region of Volterra, there is a very salty water, so a brine that comes out of certain wells, un'acqua salsa che si cava di certi pozzi. And that is exactly what they used to get salt in spite of the, of the people from Pisa that were trying to cut them off in terms of uh, supply from the seaside. And it says here, non solo la città di Volterra, ma anche quella di Firenze, con tutto il suo contado, altro sal non ad opera che quello. They use only that kind of salt. And that comes from a brine. It comes from a saturated solution that comes literally out of the ground. Chemistry. Uh, let's talk a little bit about chemistry because more or less the time is right to move to practical subjects. What is salt? What is salt made of? Of course, salt is made of two elements. We know that today, but it is quite difficult to um, tell you straight away how it was discovered because it, it's a discovery that came surprisingly late for many, many years. Even chem great chemists like Lavoisier realized that salt was not an element, but we're not able to split it into smaller components, into smaller elements. And the first step towards a change, a revolution in chemistry is, is uh, due to Robert Boyle, to the Irish. Uh, he was a philosopher, physician, naturalist, uh, and of course, alchemist. The chemist, a very good friend of Newton. That for the first time, hypothesizes the idea of some sort of force, some sort of interaction between particles, which is what is responsible for all the chemical changes. Now, what we call a bond in general, a, um, a chemical bond. In the Optics, which is a book related to physics, so not much about chemistry in that book, Boyle in 1704, so you see how young chemistry is, it's still 1700s and we still don't know anything about the real elements. He writes that there, are some, there is some sort of force, uh, some force that attracts particles, which is exceedingly strong in immediate contacts and in small distances performs some chemical changes and reaches not far with any sensible and reaches not far from the particles with any sensible effects. So something that is very strong when the particles are localized and it decreases in intensity while you pull, you pull them apart. That is precisely what an ionic bond, if you remember the potential energy curve, that's exactly what, it, what happens. So without knowing, he anticipated the modern chemistry by a great deal of time. Then people started talking about affinities. So why a certain element is interacting with another one and not with the third one? So why there are some, um, they compare them to emotional affinities. Why certain people like another person and not a third one? Why there are some specific affinities between the elements and between the materials? And they started compiling very complex tables. You see one here where you have their chemical symbols of different, of different compounds and elements, and they were ranked in order of higher and higher affinity. So something that is very close in this table to another element will be more likely to combine than something that is far apart. But that was very messy, very difficult to navigate through. Everyone had his own symbols. It was extremely complicated. Alchemy was finally um, 
overcome was replaced by a modern scientist, by a modern science, and that was due to Lavoisier, to the modern chemist that we all know about, with a much more rational, a much more specific approach. You've heard of the conservation of mass, the, the um, Traité Elementaire, which is the very first book of chemistry, up to the point that in 1869 we get to this, to this, which is the quintessential representation of the order of the elements from the chaos. So that's a periodic table due to the Russian uh, extremely uh, enlightened chemist uh, Dmitry Mendeleev, where now we can see not only individual elements, so materials that are composed only of one type of atom, and of course salt is not there, but also we can find some relationship, those forces, those interactions, just by looking at the position of the elements on the table. And in particular, there must be some sort of um, unifying force because sodium and chlorine are placed in these two sides of the uh, far apart in the table. And we know that they are really, really uh, eager to bind to each other. So sodium chloride is table salt. Now we know that the combination of these two elements leads to this amazing, this beautiful uh, structure of the, of the white crystals that we all know. So now this part was more um, an outreach type of uh, description, so I will not spend a lot of time into this because all of you certainly, thanks to my colleague here, know that uh, bonds are generally classified, um, at least bonds between different elements are generally classified according to two categories. In the case of water, for example, hydrogen and oxygen bind covalently, so you have an um, overlap, oops, sorry, you have an overlap of the electrons or the orbitals, if you wish, of one atom with the other to form individual strong covalent bonds. And that's the case of the directional bonds, which give the water molecule the specific geometry. But I'm sure you all know that in sodium chloride, the bond is not of that kind. So you have what we call an ionic bond. So you take the sodium atom, you take the chlorine atom, you get them close enough to each other. And what happens is not a sharing of electron, but it's a transfer of electrons. In particular, one electron moves to the chlorine atom from the sodium atom, and you get a sodium plus ion and a chloride ion. And also the size change, and you get different electronic properties, more stability, and so on. And only when these two things combine and get to a sufficiently close distance, and you obtain what we call an ionic bond, which is due to transfer of electrons and not to, um, and not to sharing, not to over, uh, overlapping of orbitals. And then how do you make crystals? Obviously, you just repeat the same unit over and over again. So you can get to a situation where you have a perfectly ordered um, structure. And you can see here a beautiful example, which, by the way, is made using uh, uh, these are polystyrene balls, styrofoam balls that are uh, purchased, especially at Christmas time, you can find them almost everywhere. While the black ones, I think it was a clever idea, they are the recycled sponge that we use during COVID time for the microphones. So at least it's a little bit of a more peaceful, more uh, something we can appreciate a bit more now to recycle those materials. Anyway, the white balls, the larger ones, are supposed to represent uh, chloride ions because they are larger, and the smaller ones are supposed to represent sodium ions a beautiful crystal lattice, which gives a very ordered structure to salt crystals. And that explains why the crystals, especially if you look at the very tiny ones under a microscope, they have an almost perfect cubical shape. I have also here a few of them. So if you're interested to have a look, some larger ones about one centimeter side. If you get rock salt, where the deposits have been forming over thousands, millions of years, you can get almost as close as you can uh, imagine to perfect cubes because this crystallization has been very slow, the planes are always well arranged, and you get these beautiful, these are called halite crystals, they are made of sodium chloride, but they are extremely rare, especially the well-formed ones, and they are quite beautiful. So I think this is more or less what I wanted to say about the uh, composition, and with this very basic knowledge, and also with all the knowledge that you have already obtained by studying some chemistry here, you will be able to appreciate, to um, enjoy, I hope also, some experiments that we can perform using um, using salt as the main material. So maybe we can have the lights a little bit higher up, but we still need to keep the slides on. Okay, so the first uh, technological process that we want to discuss regarding salt is, of course, its decomposition. Because salt has been, uh, of course, very useful as a material, so we still have very large amounts of salt uh, commercialized for uh, 
for all sorts of purposes, but also it's an extremely useful material for the chemical industry. And the first process that we will discuss is the electrolysis of salt solutions. So one of the most important, probably the most important chemical use of salt, if we take it on its own, is the electrolysis of brine. And I'm told that you just studied last week or a few days ago electro uh, electrolysis processes and electrochemistry in general. So that's a perfect time to have a little demonstration of, of that. So I have here a, a square a rectangular glass container. Uh, we can fill that up with brine. And we will place a white background behind it. I hope this will be easily uh, visible. For people in the back, probably you will not be able to see much, but um, the slides will help us regarding that. I have here connected to the plug a transformer, which provides an, um, quite a power for quite a steady supply of electric energy. And I have here two electrodes that are connected to the transformer. So we'll put them into, uh, into the tank of sodium chloride solution. We'll need also a little separator, but we'll come to that in a second. So the process is simply the breakdown of sodium chloride into chlorine, sodium hydroxide and hydrogen. So that's the chemistry that happens. But let's try to understand why that happens. And also, especially, let's try to see that. So we'll take a glass container. We fill it up with brine, which is a solution of sodium chloride in water. It's a very constant, almost saturated solution. So in the solution, we have sodium plus ions, chloride ions and water. And a lot of water. Without the salt, the process would be the electrolysis of water, but it would be very slow because water is not very conductive. So having salt actually does help speeding up the process. But also due to the nature, the chemical nature of chloride ions, it's not the same process as water electrolysis. So we'll get different products. We don't get hydrogen and oxygen, as you've seen in your lectures, but we'll get different products. So we stick in a separator. The separator is not really necessary here. I'm actually the solution is just one. I'm not putting in a separator which physically divides the solution. It's just a little barrier to, to avoid having too much mixing. This is as you see in the slide, it's shown with, with holes. It's not something meant to separate two cells. There needs to be electrical conductivity below and around the separator. It's just because I wanted to show you what happens on one side and on the other side separately. So we stick in the two electrodes and we apply a, dif a potential difference. It's a bit more than um, a battery. We have, a, um, let's call it a transformer here. It's a generator that I can plug now into the wall because it wasn't plugged and we turn on the, the current. Those of you who are very close to the front or maybe the front two, three rows, you can already see certainly the bubbles being formed. We don't need the reaction to proceed for a very long time, first of all, because it's already enough to, to see what we need to see. And also because chlorine is one of the products and chlorine is toxic, so we don't want to fill the room with a toxic gas. But clearly you can see a lot more gas produced on one side and a little bit less on the other side. That has to do with the reactivity of the electrodes, but still you are producing hydrogen on one side and chlorine on the other side. Can you see all this the, besides the gas formation, can you see anything else? Well, probably not, because all the products, if we go back to the reaction, all the products here, besides chlorine, which is pale yellow, are completely colorless. Hydrogen is a colorless gas and sodium hydroxide is a colorless compound. So we need to find a different way to show you that these reactions are really happening. So I'll tell you more or less what is going on here after we've added our potential difference, we'll see electrons being drawn from the positive electrode and being pumped into the negative electrode. That's what the transformer does. It sets a potential difference and keeps it stable over time. So that means that here a process will need to produce electrons, while on the other side, a process will need to pick up electrons. So you see the bubbles of gas being formed, but besides that, you don't see anything else. So once we disconnect the power supply, what is left is basically a steel solution. But what we know is that on one side, we'll have the uh, consumption, the uh, oxidation of chloride ions to give molecular chlorine from oxidation number minus one to oxidation number zero. While on the other side, you will have water, actually the hydrogen in water being reduced to uh, hydrogen gas. So those are the processes going on. I cannot really tell you just that this is happening and you have to believe me. I try to find, I, I had to try to find a way to prove to you that we are really making chlorine on one side and sodium hydroxide on the other side. So that's very easily done with some indicators. So we can put in on this side of the flask of the container an indicator with re, which reacts with chlorine and on the other side an indicator which reacts with sodium hydroxide. And you will see that those molecules, those substances have been formed. 
So we switch off the power supply and we add now on this side a mixture of iodide and starch, which is a colorless solution. You see here that's completely colorless. If we add just a couple of drops next to the positive electrode, you will see the formation of a beautiful blue color. And if I put the same indicator on the other side, there is basically no blue color at all. So that is a very complex reaction. It's, uh, uh, it has to do with the formation of iodine from iodide and then the interaction of iodide with starch. So that's a complex thing. But what really matters is that you form this halo, this blue black color, which is a clear indication of a strong oxidizer in solution. You see it here next to the uh, positive electrode, the red clamp and you don't see it on the other side next to the negative electrode. On the other side, we, can, we have the production of sodium hydroxide, so it's quite easy to show that with a pH indicator. So I can take this, which is phenolphthalein. It's a pH indicator which is colorless in neutral and acidic conditions, and it's pink in the presence of a base. So if we put this next to the other electrode, we expect, of course, to find a beautiful pink color that it is. And also on the other side, you see basically no pink. Sometimes there is a bit of diffusion, so you might see a little bit of pink on the other side, but that's not due to formation of base on the other compartment. It's just the one on the left diffusing out a little bit. It seems to be doing pretty well this time. Yeah, I think it's good. We can also mix it up a little bit. Why do you think the indicator is floating? Brine is extremely dense, so it's obviously uh, anything else that I can add to it will have lower density, and so it will float on top. But if I mix it a little bit, you will see. You have there the purple halo and the sodium hydroxide in presence of this indicator turns the mixture dark, uh, well, very bright pink magenta color. So that's the electrolysis of brine. Now this is done in a not very preparative way. The electrodes are made of graphite. After a while they get destroyed, they get decomposed. So it's not the best way ever. But imagine this doing in, uh, done in industrial scale on Kastner cells containing large amounts of brine, you can produce chlorine and sodium hydroxide for the whole world. So you take from salt something as precious as chlorine for all the disinfectants, the uh, pharmaceuticals or organic chemicals and so on, and all the sodium hydroxide. Anywhere a process requires a base, you'll put in something like that which comes from salt. So that is quite remarkable and very, very important in industrial um, applications. Now, another thing that I need to mention in the meantime, I'll clear up a little bit, mainly because I need to clean the electrodes immediately, otherwise they get very uh, difficult to clean later on. So the next slide is about um, something that I only have to talk about without showing you a precise experiment. It's about a chemical that I can make just by simply doing this. So I take away the separator and actually I use the separator to mix the cell. When I do that, of course, you would expect something um, chemical. You cannot see anything because everything now is both pink and, and black. But chemically, something is happening in here. And we are forming yet another very important industrial chemical. We are forming bleach. So bleach, the most commonly known bleaching agent, is sodium hypochlorite. We use it to clean and uh, whiten our clothes every day, basically. It's made exactly by mixing the products of these two, of these two half reactions. So combining the sodium hydroxide with the chlorine. If you mix everything up and also make sure that the chlorine doesn't escape, as it did in this case, you would have yourself a pool of bleach. That's what we sell as sodium hypochlorite solution. Let's have a look at the reaction, which is shown here. Chlorine plus sodium hydroxide to give hypochlorite, chloride and water. That is a very interesting reaction to balance. I don't know if you've done any exercise on that, but here there is chlorine that changes the oxidation states in two different directions. Very interesting one. It's called a disproportionation reaction. Now, bleach has been invented by a Frenchman that found out by accident that if you mix everything up, you obtain a bleaching solution. This was uh, produced on a key next to in Paris. The key was named Javel and the guy was known uh, as uh, was Claude Libertolet. He was a great chemist, but by accident he found out that mixing everything up gives you a very good bleaching solution, which is not as difficult to handle as chlorine because chlorine is a gas, it escapes and so on. You mix everything up, you get hypochlorite. He was so humble that he didn't decide to call it Eau de Bertollet, he called it Eau de Javel because of the Javel uh, key that was where his laboratory was situated in Paris. So still in France, the, the bleaching agents based on chlorine are known as Eau de Javel. Berthollet also is one of my favorite characters because he was responsible for the modern pyrotechnics. He discovered chlorates, perchlorates, so all the fireworks industry was born thanks to his uh, efforts. Unfortunately, I cannot show you any uh, fireworks today. I would like to, but unfortunately the smoke alarms are not deactivated, so we cannot do any reactions in that sense, but maybe for another time.
anyway, there's a lot of very interesting chemistry that you could look up for Bertolini. So bleach, again, comes from salt. So chlorine, sodium hydroxide, bleach, and so on. A lot of chemicals coming from this plentiful inorganic material. Yet one more from uh, French technologists, the Solvé process. Now this, uh, I cannot even attempt to show you a demonstration on that. Maybe you've seen this before. Maybe you haven't mentioned that in the, in the lectures. It's just a reaction. If you look at that, it seems quite mm, innocent. Yeah, it's sodium chloride, calcium carbonate to give sodium carbonate and calcium chloride. Sodium carbonate is very well known in the industry. It's called, um, well, in Italy, it's called the Solve Soda. It's uh, known as soda ash in English. It's sodium carbonate. It's a very common material for uh, paints, for varnishes, for glass making. So it's extremely useful. And this is made with a very, very clever bit of uh, chemical engineering, which I don't think I have time to uh, talk about, but it would be a great shame because it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful example of recycling internally the materials. Basically, you start from salt and limestone, which are the most cheap, probably the, one of the cheapest sets of starting materials you can possibly imagine, and you get just these two. But the way this is done is absolutely amazing. You have a series of very complicated systems where you see only sodium chloride and calcium carbonate going in, and only sodium carbonate and calcium chloride going out. And if you notice, this is a thermodynamically unfavored reaction. So how this can happen with recycling of ammonia and CO2 is amazing. We don't have time to talk about it, but I hope some of you at least will be interested in learning more about that. So yet another chemical that we get from salt is hydrogen chloride, or at least what we sometimes inappropriately call hydrochloric acid. And I'm going to try to demonstrate this other process as well, which is very difficult. I've um, discussed that a long time. It's not easy to do this experiment, but I'll try because I really, I wanted to do it in a different way, but we try to uh, show you some live chemistry as much as possible. So as you see on the slide, uh, most of the, uh, or at least a good portion of the hydrogen chloride on the market is made by this apparently very wasteful process, reacting a strong acid, which is sulfuric acid with sodium chloride, again with salt. So if you have a good supply of sulfuric acid, which is not a problem, it's one of the most common chemicals, you can also make hydrogen chloride and therefore make hydrochloric acid by dissolving it into water. So the reaction is surprisingly simple. So I can take a little bit of salt. This is a uh, normal table salt, fine salt. Uh, I'll put a little bit in this beaker. And I'll put the beaker inside this other bigger beaker. Hydrogen chloride is an extremely toxic gas when it's in a pure dry state, but unfortunately, as Primo Levi states in one of his tales in the Sistema Periodico in his book, he's a, a, not a particularly vile enemy, so it comes to you screaming, Primo Levi says, because you can smell it much before it can do any harm. So if any in the front row are a bit affected by that, don't worry, it's not going to be very violent because we'll cover it up and we'll stop the reaction immediately. But it's a very acrid gas that will make your breath a bit difficult. So we have here some sulfuric acid and we try to pour the sulfuric acid on top of the thing without um, without putting it too much like that. OK, and you can see a very vigorous reaction, a strong effervescence. I hope it doesn't go, go over. Let's hope it doesn't. OK, so you see a gas being formed and I can prove to you that this gas is acidic and I know that the container is full when this will happen. Just by placing next to the opening of the flask a little bit of ammonia. <laughs> ammonia, and I can see that it's full, ammonia reacts with the hydrochloric acid to form ammonium chloride. So it's enough to do that. And I see a beautiful puff of smoke of ammonium chloride. Not too much, otherwise the fire alarms will go off. Okay. Now, <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Oops. Now we'll quench the reaction by placing it into water. <laughs> Oof. Luckily, it, it screams at you, so don't worry. It's not. It's going to be toxic only at much higher concentrations. So now we have this glass, which is full of this very strongly acidic gas, which is a pure gas. It's hydrochloric acid in the gaseous form. And I have here some universal indicator just to prove to you that it's acidic. Notice that there is no sulfuric acid in the bottom. Yeah? Only the gas is present in here. So I can pour in some water containing universal indicator. This is made slightly basic by the addition of sodium hydroxide. And you will see immediately that this changes color and forms a red solution because the hydrochloric acid is formed by this solution in water. And this is very, 
It's a very enjoyable experience for everyone. No, okay. <clears throat> Luckily, okay, we discussed that with our safety advisor. It is relatively fine because the quantities are small and the room is big. But if anyone in the front row is a bit distressed, don't worry. It's not going to be a toxic concentration, but it can make your throat a bit dry, as mine in this case. It's not a big deal. Okay, so that's the production of hydrochloric acid. So we've made bleach, we've made uh, sodium hydroxide, we've made chlorine, we've made hydrochloric acid. A lot of chemistry happens thanks to salt. So I hope this will be convincing enough. We are approaching the uh, the end. I don't know how we are doing with time. There is a bit more couple of sections to go through. OK, so. This idea of decomposing salt with uh, sulfuric acid to form a gaseous acid was uh, one of the many, many discoveries of Joseph Priestley and Priestley called this gas marine acid air. So it's an acid air. It's as you can see, it's an air because I was breathing in quite a lot of it. It's a different type of air. It's um, acidic and it's marine, so it comes from salt, it comes from sea salt. So he called it marine acid air. The name hydrochloric acid came a lot later. Also, for in some um, periods, this was called muriatic acid. Still today, it's known as muriatic acid, but it's not a systematic name. So that was Priestley and the hydrochloric acid solution formed by salt. Yet again, um, a little bit of, pyro of pyrotechnics, I can definitely tell. Let's say I can join some concepts related to, to salt chemistry with some pyrotechnic concepts that I really like to uh, show you today. There is a strong connection between salt and yellow fireworks, in particular yellow fireworks, not all fireworks, yellow fireworks, because the yellow color in fireworks is always due to, um, to, to compounds that are derived from salt. So I have here a, a little plate on which I will place three cotton balls. And I'll pour over that a little bit of a solution containing the flammable solvent. This is methanol, including a tiny bit of water and some sodium chloride. So. Actually, I forgot to bring with me some pure methanol, so I cannot show you what the flame of pure methanol is like, but we can switch off now the uh, background uh, like that. OK, and we can switch off the lights and after I've sealed carefully all the containers of flammable material, we can set fire to this. Um, Yeah. And you will see and uh, give it, give it some time, give it some, it gets better. So you will see a flame that you will probably recognize. Yeah, you have seen that every single time you are cooking pasta or vegetables or something with salty water, the foam goes all over the pot and it flows over the flame and the flame becomes exactly that color. Have you seen that the gas flame, the blue flame becomes orange, yellow orange because of the sodium chloride. So this is due. What you are seeing here is the emission, the emission spectrum of sodium. So you are seeing the sodium atoms which are excited by the flame. Their electrons jump up due to the thermal energy of the flame that is provided. And when they fall down, they give away the exactly, exactly specific wavelengths of light, including those very bright yellow and oranges that um, constitute the characteristic spectrum, the emission spectrum of sodium ions. Now, why is this connected only to sodium chloride? And that's why the things get interesting. So we can show the same process done with lithium chloride and potassium chloride, which are just above and just below the, uh, the sodium uh, box in the periodic table. So they are alkali metals. I'll put them in the right order. So lithium goes that way. This is potassium. I have to be very careful pouring this away from the flame because it's quite methanol is quite flammable. You need to be extremely careful when you perform these experiments, avoiding uh, you know, problems with safety. OK. So this is potassium. It will take a few seconds to get it will get better because now there's some cotton burning. And lastly, we have lithium. Already our naked eye can tell the difference, but it will get a little bit better in a second. We have lithium as well. So you see now the potassium flame is very violet, it's very it's par partially purple, and this will become a very beautiful crimson red magenta color. We will leave them for a few seconds because I have another one to show you with sodium. Um, so here you see the emission spectra of three different alkali metals. Notice that the chemical reactivity is the same. So lithium chloride, sodium chloride, and potassium chloride are very similar reactivities. In the meantime, I can also show you another application of the yellow flame of sodium. But notice that this is exactly how the colors are produced in fireworks. You get different elements which are 
in the compositions of those you know stars and materials that are blown up in the sky and when they burn they give off characteristic lights which have all to do with your atomic spectra that you studied in this course the chemistry is literally everywhere um, we, I'll show you this reaction with the sodium in a slightly more with the with the sodium ions in a slightly larger scale because I quite like this reaction it's the only type of fire effect that I can perform in a sealed environment with smoke alarms because it's a completely smokeless reaction. And that is done by taking a little bit of methanol, which is uh, not pure methanol, this one. I have no idea where it is here. Yes. It's methanol combined with a little bit of water to which I will add just a few drops of brine, my uh, brine stock, which is sodium chloride solution. So now we have a mixture of methanol, water and brine. Uh, that's probably enough. So this doesn't always work with a very spectacular effect in terms of color, but I invite you all to have a look at the flame that will be uh, quite readily apparent in a few minutes. We will put this uh, volatile and flammable material into this empty container. Of course, uh, for a chemist, something that is empty means that it's full of air. Yeah, this is not really empty. It's full of air in there. So air is now being in is now placed in contact with the with the methanol and now we shake the container so that the methanol starts to evaporate. We'll have here a very uh, large amount of methanol vapor. Now I can also open the cap and if you listen, maybe yeah, you hear some gas escaping because the methanol is a volatile liquid. It's evaporating and now we have an explosive mixture containing methanol and air, methanol vapor and air. Keep in mind that this also contains sodium, so I'm expecting quite a big flame, not an explosion, it's a controlled flame, but a big flame and the flame should be yellow because the sodium ions are present in the mix. So we will leave it here and I will try to step away from it as much as possible and use a little lighter. Maybe let's keep it covered just in case it blows up, blows up prematurely. So if you're ready, have a look at the flame of methanol burning in the presence of sodium ions and you see a beautiful orange. Okay. And also now you see that the colors are fully developed. This is a slightly purplish color. This is a very bright yellow and that is clearly a crimson red reddish color. And also notice here the products of the combustion, which are now cooling down and the uh, uh, partial vacuum formed inside is now crushing the bottle until it will completely collapse. And we can probably move on to our next uh, topic on the slides. Also, the very same yellow color is something quite familiar to you. You have seen that yellow color not only when the salt water overflows on the on the stove, but also in street lights, especially on high uh, traffic highways you get those orangey yellowy lights, which are very cheap. They are very low maintenance. You don't need to change them very often. And those are sodium lamps. They contain sodium vapors. They are very good at lighting the highways. They produce a lot of light, but they are not very good lights for indoors because you, your skin would look a bit gray. So nobody uses them indoors, but they are very common on uh, highways where you need a lot of light for basically all year round. And they are produced, the light is produced by ex excited uh, sodium vapors inside the light bulb. So not only yellow fireworks, not only salt on your gas stove, the same color is also visible in uh, highway uh, lights. One topic before the last one, we need to speak a little bit about the material these pans were made of, because I told you already from the Agricola book, but still nowadays in some places, brine is normally uh, turned into salt by heating it into a lead pan. So the containers, these are, okay, today this is mostly for historical purposes. Nobody really does that anymore, but that's what they did in a museum a couple of years ago. They used a steel pan, which also started to corrode. But originally in uh, Roman times, they used to use lead pans like that. And this was a, this is a real item. It's not a replica that was displayed in Nantwich Museum where we did the, the presentation. This is more or less an excuse to uh, show you a little bit of the chemistry of lead because one might wonder why do we use lead of all the possible options, all the metals, all the materials we have, why really lead? And there is, uh, well, first of all, lead was easy to work. You could easily make sheets of lead. You could easily fold them into pans. So that's one of the reasons. But also one of the reasons is that lead is not attacked by salt, while iron, steel, for example, is. Corrosion can take place a lot more easily in the presence of, uh, well, for, for iron than for, for lead. So 
uh, I wanted to show you especially one reaction which is very relevant to that topic. And since we are at it, we'll just show a bit of chemistry of lead as well, which is one of my favorite elements personally. So I have here a solution of lead nitrate, which is made by dissolving lead in nitric acid. Very simple reaction there. And I can uh, split it into four uh, equal quantities in these four beakers here. It's a very dilute solution, so I should really wear gloves for this, but it doesn't. I mean, it's not that concentrated and also we are trying not to spill it all over the place. So to one of these solutions, we will add, uh, I'll leave the colorless one just to show for comparison. To the first one, we'll add some brine. And this will show you exactly why it's not a problem to heat brine into a, uh, into a lead pan. So as you can see, there is a precipitate of lead chloride. But lead precipitates in the form of lead chloride. So you get a very thick, very heavy white precipitate. So the second one is with iodide. So something similar to sodium chloride. This is sodium iodide. And you will see if everything works, a completely different reaction. You can see a very beautiful, very thick yellow pigment. This has been used actually for some centuries as a pigment. It's one of the many artificial, um, uh, some, one of the many artificial mineral dyes that you could make using chemistry. And this is also a material that you could easily recrystallize. I don't have time and uh, equipment to show you that. But if you take that solution of suspension, you heat it and you cool it down again, you get these beautiful golden uh, crystals that you are more than welcome to have a look at later, which are another example, another um, testimony to the beauty of crystalline materials. They really look like gold flakes. And somehow we managed to do what the alchemists did to turn something containing lead into something that looks like gold. But of course, there's no gold in here. It's entirely made of lead and iodine. Then I can show you also a couple more reactions with the lead since we have it here. Another reaction is, is with bleach. So we, if we react the same bleach that we made before, combining sodium hydroxide with chlorine, that reacted with um, reacted with the lead solution will give you a a precipitate again, something that is not very soluble, but that changes color a little bit over time. At the beginning, it was more white, and now it's turning more to orange, and in the end, it will turn to brown. That is an extremely complicated reaction. It forms lead into three different oxidation states, and what you see there is not lead hypochlorite, it's a mixture of oxides of lead. So the color changes, the precipitate tends to fall to the bottom. It is quite a complex chemical change, but again, showing a bit of the chemistry of lead. And lastly, this is with sodium sulfide. This will turn lead into lead sulfide, which is a very dark black precipitate. Yeah, that's extremely dark. And actually, one of the most common lead minerals in nature is exactly this substance, this is lead sulfide, known also as galena, which is a black mineral from which we extract most of the lead we use in industry. OK, so uh, this was a bit of a digression on, on lead. We can switch back to the slides. So I showed you there the precipitation of lead chloride, lead iodide, a mixture of lead oxides and um, lead sulfide. So that was a little excursus on the chemistry of lead. Um, now, especially this very last reaction is quoted in another, one of, another of my favorite books in, in the history of the chemical literature. It's the detection of lead using sulfide ions because this is a um, one of the very earliest books on food fraud, on fraud detection in, in, um, in well, food sophistication detection. It's a treatise on adulterations of food and culinary poisons. And you see on the cover, there is death in the pot, we see that, which is a citation from the Bible, of course, but it is also quite relevant. It was quite common at the time. This is 1820, you see there. It was quite common at the time to have uh, all sorts of adulterations in food. As long as you could sell your product, nobody cared. As long as you had the right color, the right appearance, the right taste, they would put things like arsenic, cyanide. They would put all sorts of horrible things in, in food as coloring agents or as additives. And this book tells you also how to spot, you see here, methods of detecting them, how to spot certain types of poisoning. And you can see food, here it's a chapter, food poisoned by lead and vessels. So where the lead can leach into the food and turn it into something poisonous. And on the chapter about poisonous cheese, which apparently was a big thing at the time, there is a statement, you see that here, this dangerous sophistication, the presence of lead into cheese, may be detected by macerating a portion of the cheese in water with sulfurated hydrogen. That's basically what we did here. You put the cheese into this solution. If the cheese turns black, you have a 
clear evidence of the presence of lead or many other metal ions as well. So again, that's a nice, um, interesting read if you are interested in all, all sorts of contaminations and, and horrible uh, additives that were used in the more or less Victorian time before the laws against food sophistications came about. OK, I think this is more or less all I wanted to show you, except for the very last point, because of course we need to finish with something uh, quite extraordinary. And this took a very long time to arrange. I hope it will work because it took an, an amount of paperwork you have no idea about. But we last time it worked, so I hope it will be the same. We spoke about salt for about one hour and a half. Is it more or less about uh, more than an hour? Now it's time to make some salt. So let's take the elements and make some salt. This is normally very difficult to uh, achieve. We need a bit of clear space and very much focus. Really, it's uh, quite dangerous. We cannot mess this up. You can easily imagine the reaction that we are going to exploit for this, and it's the reaction between sodium and chlorine. Grazie mille. For this one, we need some uh, special precautions. We have here a jar of chlorine. Chlorine is a colorless, uh, sorry, it's a colored gas. It's a colored gas. Uh, I had also a piece of paper somewhere here. Yeah. So you can clearly see that this gas is yellow. So this cylinder, this gas jar is full of chlorine gas. And we have here in this box a sample of, uh, of sodium. Sodium is an alkali metal. It's extremely reactive. It explodes in the contact of water. Chlorine is a poisonous gas. And yet, combining. And please appreciate it that we travel by using our car with a car. glass jar full of and the sodium chlorine. And the sodium. <laughs> Uh, now, jokes aside, it's not particularly dangerous, but we need to take some precautions in order to avoid. Also, we really don't want to and any chlorine to escape in the room because it can be quite uh, distressing for the lungs. So we have here, as I said, the, the jar containing the chlorine and a little bit of sodium. So in order to do this safely, we need to um, provide some heat energy. So first of all, let's talk about the reaction, how we made that chlorine and uh, how we are going to conduct it. And then I'll show you later on what is going to happen. So how to make a grain of salt. So finally, we'll make some salt according to the best recipe, which is the combination of uh, sodium with chlorine. How did we make the chlorine? So we don't have access to chlorine cylinders in our lab, so we had to make it from scratch. And we started yet again from a chemical that comes from salt. So we took the sodium hypochlorite, basically bleach. We mix it with hydrochloric acid, which also was made from salt. Combining these two together will give you chlorine and sodium chloride back. So as you can see, all the cycle is closed. We have bleach, we have sodium hydroxide, chlorine, hydrochloric acid, and now back to chlorine, and all of it is self-sufficient. And even the sodium, you might be surprised to know, even the sodium is made from salt because the electrolysis of malt and sodium chloride will give you chlorine and sodium. So all the chemicals we've used today, except for the little bit of lead there, were originated were produced from salt, which is quite a remarkable feature of industrial chemistry. So lastly, this is the reaction we will perform and it will be uh, it will take place over a heat proof tile. I hope not to burn any holes in this beautiful table that the university is providing. So we have here a few dangerous things that we need to remove, especially all the flammable solutions, all the bits that could catch fire with unexpectedly. Excuse me, this is also quite dangerous, and we move this one away. It's not an explosion, it's a controlled combustion, but it's quite a vigorous, quite a violent combustion. So first of all, we need to clean the sodium. We need to take the sodium piece, and we need to clean it up. And in order to do that, I need just a piece of tissue, which I have in my pocket. Okay, that's quite a big piece of sodium, so it will be fun to dispose of that later on. We'll place it in the, sorry, we'll place it first in a cleaning fluid, which is um, just uh, some methanol. We'll just clean it from, to remove a little bit of the oxide on the surface. Yes. Okay. And now at room temp, I could just in introduce this into the jar of chlorine, but the reaction is a bit too slow. We don't want to have a delay on that because otherwise we don't know how to switch it off. So we need to have the reaction to happen immediately. So to do that, we will just heat up the sodium. We just need a very powerful flame. We can have all the lights down, I think, now because it is quite important to. Oof, okay. As soon as the sodium reaches the correct temperature, I have maybe let's put one extra mat underneath because you never know. I really don't want to be the one who destroys one of the tables in your lecture hall. Okay. 
As soon as I have a self-sufficient reaction, the sodium will start burning in air because sodium is a very reactive metal. Now it's turned into a shiny ball. It's liquid, it's almost molten now. And very soon, the flame will be self-sustaining. That's the time when we need to introduce it to the chlorine. If the flame is not self-sustaining, the experiment will fail. So we need to have, a you see now the sodium burning in air, producing sodium oxide. And there you see the beautiful formation of sodium chloride starting from sodium and chlorine. The plate has cracked now, but fortunately the cardboard underneath should protect the table. And now if we can have the lights back up in a few seconds, in a few seconds we will show you that we've made a cloud of salt. You see inside here a white powder. You can all guess what the white powder is. It is sodium chloride. So that is the power of chemistry. We turn an explosive metal, something that explodes in contact with water and a very toxic gas. Both of them could easily kill us into something that we put into our food. So if we have the, yeah, okay, you can see also the cloud of salt being formed. So that's for the very first time for you, a cloud of salt. One more thing and with this we finish. If I very briefly, I cannot leave it up for very long. If I very briefly lift up the jar, you will see a bit of salt trickling down the table, especially if I do that. Yeah, so that is a cloud of salt. I am quite safe with this because I know that all the chlorine is gone. There is an excess of sodium, so there should be no chlorine left. This is just salt, but I cannot let it all out because of the smoke alarms. So you see now a cloud of salt around here. So we have made a grain of salt starting from sodium and chlorine. OK, so this is more or less the end. It's time for me to conclude. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me for listening to this talk. I have just one more slide for the acknowledgments. So this is not all my uh, this is not all my doing. So it's very very important for me to acknowledge a lot of people. Some people who uh, funded some of the studies, some of the experiments. Professor Tessaro for inviting me. All of you for your attention, and also some of the colleagues who provide you some, some input. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed. And now we'll clean up the mess. Thank you. <laughs>